Yes. Let me say good morning to everyone. First of all, it's an honor to be here in Daytona Beach and lead uh, this discussion about a man who made history and helped change the landscape in Major League Baseball. Many are not familiar uh, with the fact that it basically all started right here in Daytona Beach at City Island Ballpark 70 years ago tomorrow. We'll have a chance to let some of you in the audience participate in our discussion. If you have any questions that you want to ask. But first of all, we do have a lot to talk about, and we don't have a lot of time, but it's a very, very interesting and gut-wrenching experience that a lot of the people that you're getting ready to meet have gone through. So let me, without further ado, meet our panel. We'll start with a young man by the name of Harold Lucas. Harold Lucas was a youngster here in Daytona Beach 70 years ago and spent his days shagging balls for Jackie Robinson and other major leaguers. He went on to become a coaching legend and is one of Bethune-Cookman's biggest financial supporters. Today he'll share with us his recollection of the days he spent around the living legend, Jackie Robinson. Bill Schumann. Bill is a longtime radio newsman in Central Florida. He's also a historian and documentarian who has amassed thousands of hours of recordings and documents on, the, uh, on Jackie Robinson and his journey through Daytona Beach. In fact, uh, he has document a documentary coming out soon that he produced. He also was a contributor on a recent documentary about Robinson that was produced by Kenny Burns. Also, Albert Bethune, Jr. Albert Bethune is the grandson of Mary McLeod Bethune, was a teenager during the historic moments. He got a firsthand close up and personal look at many discussions that Dr. Bethune and had with the power brokers of this city during and after Jackie's experience in Daytona Beach. Jason Beverlin. Jason is the baseball coach here at Bethune-Cookman University, former major league pitcher, and knows firsthand how important Jackie Robinson's <laughs> legacy is, not only to major league baseball, but to baseball in general. In fact, his team is playing tonight. They'll play Kenny, uh, Quinny Piak uh, at the commemorative commemorative 70th anniversary game that will be played at Jackie Robinson Ballpark. And last but not least, George Bates. George Bates was a bat boy for the team that Jackie Robinson played for as a young lad 70 years ago. So therefore, let's give them all a big, big round of applause. Huh? You know, one of the questions people will ask, well, why, why Jackie Robinson? How did he become the one to integrate baseball. Well, first of all, let's take a look at a video that kind of answers that question. In March of 1945, Mr. Rickey told me in confidence that only the board of directors of the ball club knew, and only his family knew, and now I was going to know, that he was going to bring a black player to the white Dodgers. And Mr. Rickey said that going back to when he was the baseball coach at Ohio Western University. Uh, he took the team down to play a series at South Bend, Indiana with Notre Dame. And he said, my best player was my catcher, and he was black. But, uh, said Mr. Rickey, when we were registering uh, the squad in the uh, hotel, when the black player stepped up to sign the register, the clerk uh, jerked the register back and said, uh, we don't register niggers in this hotel. And Ricky said, I remonstrated and said, this is the baseball team from Ohio Western. We're the guests of Notre Dame University. He said, I don't care who you are. We don't register niggers in this hotel. Well, Mr. Ricky said, um, there are two beds in uh, my room, aren't there? And he said, yes. Well, he says, can't he use one bed and not register? And the clerk grudgingly uh, allowed that to happen. And Mr. Ricky took the key, handed it to the black uh, player, and said, you go up to the room and wait for me. As soon as I get the rest of the team settled, I'll be up. Mr. Ricky said, when I opened the door, I heard this fine young man was sitting on the edge of a chair, and he was crying, and he was pulling at his hands. And he said, Mr. Ricky, it's my skin. If I could just tear it off, I'd be like everyone else. And Mr. Ricky told me this day in March of 1945, he said, all these years I have heard that boy crying. And now he said, I'm going to do something about it. Branch Ricky's scouts began to scour the Negro Leagues for a likely player. 
Well, I introduced Robinson, and uh, Mr. Ricky went right to work on him. He said, Jack, I've been looking for a great colored ball player for a great many years. I have some reason to believe you might be that man. Mr. Ricky, who had never laid eyes on Robinson, sent for him and had him in his office uh, for three hours. Mr. Ricky was uh, not only very intelligent, but very intelligent vocally. He never used profanity, uh, and his strongest expletive was Judas Priest. But that morning, Mr. Ricky took Robinson into every possible negative situation he would encounter. In all the world of Jim Crowism, etc. And he, uh, he took Robinson into what would happen on the playing field, that he'd be thrown at his head, that he would be slid into and spiked, etc. Uh, he screamed in his face every expletive that Robinson would ever hear. And he said to Robinson, do you have the guts not to fight back? And he said, finally, the only way you can be the first uh, man to do this, the first black man, is you'll have to promise me that for three years you will not answer back. You cannot uh, win this by a retaliation. You can't echo a curse uh, with a curse, a blow with a blow. So Robinson gave it a little thought before he answered. And, and that impressed Ricky. If he just said right off quick, oh, I can do that. Well, he gave it some thought and he said, uh, Mr. Ricky, if uh, you want to take this gamble, I'll promise you there'll be no incident. It's here for the video, huh? Red Barber, who did a lot of the talking on that, was a famous broadcaster who broadcast the Dodgers games for 15 years between 1939 and 1953, so he got a first-hand look. But I want to address our first question to Harold Lucas. And Harold, what do you feel led Branch Rickey to seek out uh, a, a black player? Am, am I on? Okay. Uh, because of the times were changing, I'm sure that they felt that we would have to be a complete society rather than to have part of it segregated. And as we know through athletics, that is a, one of the better ways to integrate a society. And, and I first would like to give credit to Mr. Ricky for being as thorough as he was in the, uh, in the uh, choosing of Jackie Robinson. You see, first of all, he had to have a black man. I mean a man of, of a ebony hue. Because he didn't want some light-skinned guy running around out there and they have to decide if that's him or not. So he chose a black man that was black in color. Second, he had to choose a person that was educated, a person that would be able to stand the, uh, the discrimination and other things that Jackie would uh, be encountered with. So I'm sure that these are some of the things that caused him to uh, choose Jackie. When you were shagging balls for him, what, do you, what, what were you thinking back then? Did you ever think it, it would come to where it is today? Well, back in 1946, Jackie came to us, uh, he used to stand by after practice and sort of talk to the guys and say, uh, this is the beginning of a change. You're going to live through this transition when from no black foot, uh, football player, I'm a football coach, no baseball, uh, no black baseball players until having some on all of the teams. And they're going to have to be, uh, you're going to have to be ready to do this. I think that Jackie encouraged us to become a person that would understand that things happen through change, and only through change can things happen. We have another video. We want to talk about the fact that, of course, he started his career right here in Daytona Beach. And, you know, let's talk and look at the video on why the journey to Daytona Beach. Brooklyn Dodger President Branch Rickey must know the politics of Daytona Beach well. The city owns Kelly Field and City Island Ballpark. Rickey did spring training here at Kelly Field and City Island 
when he was general manager of the St. Louis Cardinals in 1937. The Cardinals had a minor league team called the Islanders at City Island. In 1945, he announced he had signed Jackie Robinson before he had signed a contract with the city to do spring training in Daytona Beach with the Royals and the Dodgers. Bethune-Cookman College creates a culture and political climate in Daytona Beach where city officials make an exception with segregation laws to allow blacks to play baseball with whites this spring training. What made Daytona Beach so different from other towns in the Deep South was the presence of Dr. Mary Cloud Bethune. She was a presence that we could identify well. She was one of our own. She had gained prominence as founder of Bethune Cookman College, and not only that, she was very close to uh, President. A rover belt at the time, and uh, his wife Elmer, they were great friends and compliments and stuff like this. So she had gained a lot of respect from the mainstream community and even the mainstream community here in Daytona Beach because she was out front and trying to ease the tension because of the segregation between the black and the white communities. If it had not been for people like Mrs. Bethune, Jay Saxon Lloyd, and Herbert Davidson, Jack never would have come to this town. Of course, we knew of her as the person who had counseled presidents and so on, and as the founder of the, of the college. So we were very respectful of her. And she just encouraged us, encouraged us to keep trying, not to be discouraged, never give up, you know, the kinds of things that a person who's been through all this could uh, advise a young couple. So she was wonderful. I'm going to address this next segment to Albert Bethune Jr., who is the grandson of Mary McLeod Bethune, on what impact and influence your grandmother and the school had on Jackie Robinson and the town of, and the city of Daytona Beach. Well, uh, first of all, I remember Branch Ritchie coming down in person himself. He didn't call mother dear. He uh, came down for a personal interview and talked with her. And uh, they were talking, I remember, uh, quite well because they were over in our home, which is now called the Foundation. And it was a remarkable thing because uh, baseball back in those days was what was happening. And uh, the things that uh, they discussed, I don't quite remember all of them, but I do know that uh, he asked her to kind of intervene with the people of Daytona Beach, uh, the people of Fowler. And you, it, it, it just so happened that uh, she was able to make the contacts that was necessary with the city officials. Uh, we we weren't in a, uh, we didn't have too much segregation here in Daytona Beach uh, after Mary McLeod Bethune came to Daytona Beach. I remember vividly. Uh, this may be all for the uh, uh, baseball uh, incident, but uh, Pine Haven Project, uh, they applied for funding for uh, better living condition homes and things. When the money came, the city officials tried to convert that money to the white uh, building of homes for the poor uh, white people. Mary McAlberton got with Mrs. Eleanor Roosevelt 
and they called, Ms. Roosevelt called the president and uh, they were able to transfer that money back to the housing authority. But that's why you have a uh, Pine Haven. Pine. But getting back to baseball, I know a baseball, I know because I was here, this is something nobody else in this building is living today other than maybe Hal and you know he's he's a little younger I'm 94 uh, maybe Hal knows a little bit of what I'm talking about but uh, what I'm trying to say that Mary McLeod Bethune she like she loves sports two things I'm gonna give you a little history one thing Mary McLeod Bethune loved, Bethune Cookman University, as it's called today, was built on music. Not baseball, not football, not basketball. The money from this institution came from choirs, quartets, and things of that nature. So uh, it was like Fisk University and, and those uh, uh, Tuskegee. Money came from voices and integration at this school was well enforced. There was no segregation in, in Whitehall over there. Just like I told my people here today, back in those days, if you came to a Sunday afternoon meeting, you sat where you could find a seat. And let me tell you something, what happened? All these wealthy people who lived over on the beach side and in Armin and everywhere, they may be sitting next to their maid in the chapel. That was unheard of back in those days. It was against the law. But it happened at Bethune Cookman. So I don't know whether I've answered your question or not, but she was a political power. She changed a lot of things, not only in Daytona Beach, but all over the world. Thank you, sir. <coughs> you know, when Jackie was playing, the team had trouble scheduling games at a lot of venues around, like. Uh, up in uh, Sanford, the police chief said he was going to uh, arrest people if he played. Uh, Jacksonville, Florida, they were scheduled to play a game, and uh, padlock all of a sudden appeared on the, the gates of the stadium in which they were going to play the land. They had some problems there. But Daytona Beach opened their arms up, uh, the city, thanks to Mary McLeod Bethune and a lot of the citizens of the city of Daytona Beach. A lot of people don't, don't remember that, that Jackie Robinson – actually started his college career at a junior college in, in California. He went to Pasadena Junior College, then went on to, to UCLA after two years at Pasadena, Pasadena Junior College, where he played four sports. He not only played baseball, but he played football, basketball, and he ran track. Uh, the ironic thing about it, as great as he was as a major league baseball player in college, he was not that good. He only batted like a 0 0.97, so or 0 0.097, if you know what that means in, in – um, in terms of baseball batting averages. Uh, but the football team at UCLA at the time was the most integrated team in the nation. There were four black players on that particular UCLA team. Uh, he won the NCAA track and field championship in the long jump. So we talk about what transpired in terms of Jackie Robinson's career. Let's look at a video that talks about his struggles and his progress. April 2, 1946. The Dodgers and their top minor league team, the Montreal Royals, are playing again at City Island Ballpark. Results matter in these exhibition games. Players are competing for their jobs as spring training is starting to wind down. Youngster George Bates is going to the game with his brother and father. 
What he doesn't know is that he and his brother will be randomly selected from the crowd to be Bat Boys. George is the Bat Boy for the Royals. His brother is with the Dodgers. His father has a movie camera to film the action. My father was one taking the pictures, and he knew that was a, a big deal there, the first time a Black was in a game with the Dodger organization. Jackie Robinson is scheduled to bat six in the lineup and will play second base. The pressure is on Robinson to start hitting better. At bat, Robinson is making a lot of contact with the ball at routine practice games, but not getting many hits. The ballpark is segregated. African American fans sit in a small grandstand near first base along the right field line. White fans sit behind home plate and along third base. Today, Robinson is facing the same pitcher he went up against on March 17th. That's righty Eddie Chandler. That March 17th game was the first for Robinson at City Island. Jackie Robinson, when he come up to bat and walk right by me, which is in some of the pitchers, and uh, I said, show him, Jackie. <laughs> This was a great game for Robinson's hitting. In three at-bats, he gets two hits and a walk. The Royals beat the Dodgers 6-1. to one. Robinson hits stride in route of Dodgers, special to the Brooklyn Eagle. Daytona Beach, Florida, April 3rd. Branch Rickey sat in the stands at City Island Park yesterday and watched his Dodgers of the future, temporarily in Montreal uniforms, out-hit, out-think, and outrun a skeleton Brooklyn team for an easy 6-1 triumph over their big brothers. He was highly pleased with Jackie Robinson, who looked like a pro for the first time this spring. But I don't know about Wright, he admitted, mentioning the other Negro he signed to keep Jackie company. He's 28 years old, and the Royals have 12 pitchers. If Wright can't make the Montreal staff, he will be released. So, George Bates, George, you were the bad boy for the, for the team back then. You have your mic there, and you're ready to to talk about your fondest memories of your position with the organization back when Jackie was playing. Yes, uh, I was very lucky that uh, me and my brother were here at that time and not in school. So that's one of the reasons they picked us, I guess, because there wasn't anyone else around. <laughs> but uh, we were already Brooklyn Dodger fans from our home in Connecticut. and. And we went to the spring training games here any time we could. And uh, that just was the biggest honor I'll ever have, that they picked us to be bat boys that day and, and the next day, too. It, that was the game right there when I was with Montreal. And I got to see some of the players I remembered from home, you know, from the Brooklyn Dodgers. And it was just a great, great time in my life. Did it ever occur to you that history was being made? Of course, back then, at, at that particular time, there were two African Americans on the, the team here, a young man named Wright and, of course, Jackie Robinson. Did, did it ever occur to you what was transpiring? Oh, yes. I was well aware of what, what was going on, and, and that's why I had my words with Jackie there about show him, Jackie, because I wanted him to do good. Now, you know, he couldn't stay with his teammates at the team hotel here in Daytona Beach. He was forced to stay at the home of a, a local black politician. What kind of impact did that have on the community as a whole as you saw it? Well, I just know what kind of an impact it had on me. It always, always bothered me that that was the case, and uh, especially when I was, you know, in town and go to a drinking fountain or something and it would say white only and uh, I just knew that wasn't right. Bill, you covered a lot of these events over the years with the documentary and things of this nature. When you look back on your fondest memories and recollection, what stands out in your mind? So, can you hear me? Good. Um, Great. I would one thing before I get into that. I would like to recognize George's son, Bill Bates. Where's Bill? Is he here? Right there. I want to recognize him because he's also helping us a lot with this too. Um, one of the things that uh, 
he's George's uh, son. Uh, one thing that's interesting about this spring training is that that April 2nd game, Jackie was really kind of in what was called a hitting slump. If you remember the uh, in the documentary part that was just shown. Uh, by the way, Dave Wall, would you stand up, Dave, for a second? He's with WDBO, and uh, he was one of the voices in my film. He was talking about the, the newspaper articles about that April 2nd game. Uh, I'm not sure I'm still researching it. That game may have been the first game. That's what the media recognized as the, as the breakout game for hitting. Um, he'd been putting the bat on the ball a lot. I was talking with the coach here about how important it is to put the ball on the bat, not be striking out. But he was in what was called a hitting slump. And what Rachel Robinson said to me was that it was a little wonder because of all the problems they were running into. There, this was the only city in the entire South that spring training that allowed baseball to happen integrated. Your grandmother, Bethune-Cookman University here, this changed the political climate that made this happen. Now, also in the last film, you just heard a little bit earlier, George Ingram. He talks about this was not an accident. This actually happened. This was a formal political alliance. This was not, this was something as you were talking about with your grandmother, this was orchestrated. It, and what George Ingram says was that it was because of the Daytona Beach News Journal, the Davidson family, Joe Harris, a political activist, and Sax Lloyd. Sax Lloyd, the name at the uh, Lake at the Speedway is named after him. He gave Bill France uh, Sr. his first job in Daytona Beach, but it was that political coalition. And then I combed through newspapers and I found out in 1945 there was an article in the St. Petersburg Times, I think May 31st, off my memory, and it says, it talks about forming a group called the Good Neighbors Association. This was before Jackie Robinson even came here. So, uh, and, and before they even knew that anybody was being signed. This just wasn't about Jackie Robinson. They were blazing trails all over the place. And your grandmother, it's such an honor. I'm thrilled, as you can tell, I'm filming you up here. I'm so excited to be up here, uh, that, to be with you. It's such an honor. Your grandmother was a genius. She changed America. I don't know how to thank you enough for what you and your family have done. And I want to thank Bethune-Cookman. Uh, Lynn Thompson, please recognize him. Without Lynn Thompson, we wouldn't have today. Uh, Lynn Thompson and I go back to high school. I remember, and I'm going to wrap this up quick, uh, but I just have to say this about Lynn Thompson. I remember when I was a senior at Mainland, I was a football player. I hung out with athletes, and I remember somebody saying, oh, this sophomore, Lynn Thompson, he's special. You've got to look for him. Boy, is he special. Bethune-Cookman is lucky to have Lynn Thompson here. He's a great leader. This is a great university. I'm a former student. It's an honor for me to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, how many of you know what number Jackie Robinson wore? 42, right? 42. UCLA has, you know, I said earlier that he played sports there, played four sports. They have retired every number 42 in every sport at UCLA. No one will ever wear 42 again. And uh, he wore different numbers at UCLA, but 42 is the one that he's mostly known for. So they've decided to, un, uh, to retire any jersey with the number 42 in all the sports on the campus of UCLA. That was one impact that Jackie had on the world of sports. Let's look at some other impacts that he had. I would like to bet that no athlete have they ever tried to intimidate more than they did Jackie Robinson? He had tons and tons of guts. But boy, I want to tell you, when they start throwing at you, at your noggin, you get mad, but you better be awful careful about doing it. And he faced that probably as much as any player his first and second year in the big leagues. The most serious incident came in St. Louis against Branch Rickey's old team, the Cardinals. Enos Country Slaughter, out at first by at least 10 feet, nonetheless jumped into the air and deliberately laid open Robinson's thigh with his spikes. Robinson's anger almost overcame him. But when his teammates threatened to retaliate, he talked them out of it. 
I never once heard Jack say out loud, I want to give up. I don't, I don't think I can take it anymore. He would get discouraged, he'd get frustrated, he'd get angry. But by the next morning, you know, he'd kind of sleep it off, and the next day was a new day. I think he felt that, one, he could transcend this provocation because he had a higher goal. I mean, he really, the goal was important to him. The mission was important to him. And he knew that he was holding himself in and constraining himself for a real purpose. Carol, I want to ask you, could today's generation be strong and as courageous as Jackie was? Uh, I think it would be hard because they don't have the background of punishment. Of, of when I use the word punishment, I'm saying of the hard times. Many of the young men today have different difficulties, uh, but they are more or less associated with integration. It was very hard back in the day to get slapped and not be able to do anything about it. These young men today would probably do something about it. <laughs> Coach uh, Beverly, uh, who are the Jackie Robinsons of the day? A couple guys that I think stick out um, in today's game. One guy just retired, Torrey Hunter. I think he's definitely carried that torch um, and was an advocate for really all players. Um, very strong voice, played hard, much like Jackie Robinson did, and uh, but was also extremely professional in everything he did and, and came every day ready to go. What do you feel that today's athletes and students know about Jackie? Well, I think, you know, most, most of the athletes today know the basic, basic story. Um, you know, it, it was really amazing for me just talking to everybody uh, backstage. I learned a tremendous amount. Um, but the, uh, you know, I think it's more about the basic story and, you know, Jackie Robinson Day, everybody wears number 42. I, I don't think there's really an appreciation for the history and the struggle that he actually went through. He was 28 years of age when he made his major league debut. And this season, the Dodgers are going to unveil a statue of Jackie Robinson at the stadium in Los Angeles. It'll be the first ever statue unveiled. The question to any of you who want to answer, why do you feel it took them so long to do this? Whoever wants to answer. Come on, oh, you know, nobody wants to answer. I just think it's great that they're doing it. Uh, you know, we're, we're, you know what I'm really proud of is that we did our uh, statue here in D Daytona Beach. Here in 19, by the way, I did this with the help of uh, Richard B. Moore, who is, uh, his grave is on this campus, a great man. And he was the uh, uh, president, of, or he was the chair of our statue committee, and he became ill in the middle of it, and then that was the last fundraising effort he did. But I'm proud that we did that. We did it before there was a Jackie Robinson Day in baseball. We did it, uh, and I'm real proud that we did that. And you know something about our community? Bethune-Cookman has created the culture that made this happen and has had an impact throughout the Daytona Beach area. You talk about the Sunday meetings. This is great. Bethune-Cookman created this culture. And your grandmother, the political genius, worked with these people to do this with Saks Lloyd and the newspaper, the Davidson family. And please, I can't say enough thanks to you for doing this. Harold, you had something to say. Charlie, you know, it's very difficult to say why someone takes a period of time to do something. There's so many stars that have to align. There's so many political things that have to be adjusted. There's so many uh, people that have to be satisfied. 
before they want to relinquish uh, an honor such as this. Hopefully, it won't take as long to do something for the next guy that sacrificed as much as Jackie Robinson did to receive his, uh, his honor. You know, the, you go ahead, you can give him a round of applause. Did, did they know at the time when Jackie was coming along, of course, a lot of people who are familiar with the old Negro Leagues, as they were called back then, that with him making progress up to the majors, that he would eventually kill the Negro Leagues? In my research, I didn't find any thought about trying to kill the Negro Leagues. I think uh, I, I, I didn't see any, I didn't really run into that as a thought. And a, you know, a person that I worked with, uh, Billy Rowe, uh, I, I miss him. Uh, he passed away years ago. He was with the Pittsburgh Courier. And, he, and if there would have been some thought of that, I think he would have brought it up with me. I did some filming with him that I'll have later uh, and uh, show, but I... I, I don't know of any kind of thought of that. I think it was more along the line of making progress with the major leagues. I think that was the focus. And one thing, too, I would like to say, they talk about the economic impact of Daytona Beach and everything and, and, and this. Um, but I do know there were a lot of people that sincerely wanted to do this. It happened to make money at the box office, but there were people like that saw the civil rights benefit of it. And I really believe that Branch Rickey was, that was a lot of his motivation too. Uh, that goes back to him with uh, the incident in, oh, when he was coaching. And I think with Sax, I know from personal conversations with Sax Lloyd and the Davidson family with the News Journal, there were a lot of people that were sincerely in their heart. They knew that racism was wrong and they wanted to see change. So your grandmother had some people to work with, thank goodness. All right, George, do you, Remember the struggles that Jackie had? As much as, not as much as I know today, because uh, I was only 12 and uh, kind of busy being a boy. All right. Now, I understand some of the students in the audience have some questions, and uh, they're going to bring, bring them up one at a time, and they can ask the questions. Go right ahead. Hi, Charlie. We have some of our student athletes that have specific questions for our panelists. This is Akedius, and he has a question for George Bates. Well, those two days, how did, um, what, what separated Jackie Robinson from the other players? I think that was obvious. <laughs> Other than being black. <laughs> <laughs> well, just that uh, the struggle he was going through, and uh, you know, he had to be nervous every every day. And uh, probably the only thing that really got him through it was he had Rachel. And Rachel, he's talking about is Rachel Robinson, his wife, who's still alive yes. at the age of ninety-three. Yes, that is correct. Okay, we have Donald. Thank you. Donald has a question for Harold Lucas. Um, as a young black man, uh, did, how did Jackie Robinson inspire you? Jackie Robinson, <coughs> first of all, Jackie Robinson came to my high school uh, that year, and he spoke to all of the students in a, a similar program just like this. But he told us about the fact that times were, he felt that times were getting ready to change and that we were going to have to be prepared for whatever the future held for us. And we looked at the future possibly being an integrated society, and that meant that we would have to be smart, we'd have to be calm, and we'd have to understand that if we want something, we have to go out there and get it. So he encouraged us to do the things that, encourage, that uh, would encourage us become a successful person. I think that was his main uh, object, be prepared. Thank you. Okay, here is Drew, and Drew has a question for Bill Schumann. Um, I was just wondering, like, how did, what was his mindset going through all the racism that was in that time? 
I'll quote uh, all the interviews I know, uh, and what I got out of that was that uh, he was under a uh, tremendous amount of stress beyond uh, thought. Uh, anybody who's played any sports knows how difficult it is to make a team, but I know from uh, the conversations I had with the coaches and the people that uh, the canceled games outside of Daytona Beach put tremendous stress on him, and it really was having an impact. That's why he was going through that hitting slump. And Rachel Robinson, I'm trying to remember her, her exact quote to me, which was something along the line of um, either you swing or you get cut. And she was saying that uh, basically you've got to start performing, and that's what was so amazing. It was superhuman what he did with all that pressure. But again, Bethune-Cookman College created a support system for him. And that was talked about quite often. Thank you. Our next question is for Mr. Bates, and this young man has a question specifically for you. Um, how did uh, Jackie Robinson carry himself before the games and like his pregame ritual and what he did before the game? I have no knowledge of what he did before the game. I, I just know that they kept a low profile during the game. I guess that's what you wanted to know. Uh, okay, thank you. And our very last question is from Mr. Cunningham, and his question is for Coach Beverly. Yes, my question is, um, I understand that Major League Baseball, uh, in Major League Baseball, African Americans are underrepresented today. So what are you as the coach doing to develop and mentor the players, the African American players to kind of help that uh, help that along uh, with the uh, with the lower uh, the lower um, level of players that are in uh, African American players in the NBA I mean in Major League Baseball today I think the biggest thing is just providing opportunity uh, many of the uh, showcases and all the things that they have now cost an unbelievable amount of money and have increased opportunity for exposure, but also limited opportunity because of uh, money, really, for you know all races. It, you know, not just the Af African American players, but um, Major League Baseball is trying to um, develop programs that they're establishing in all the major cities to try and bring back uh, baseball to the African-American community. And of course, tomorrow, the 17th, is the 70th anniversary of Jackie Robinson making his debut here in Daytona Beach, Florida. And we would like to invite each and every one of you to uh, Jackie Robinson Stadium tonight, 6 p.m., the baseball team and Coach Beverland's squad will take on Quinnipiac. We'd like to see as many people come out as they continue the celebration of Jackie Robinson's debut here in the city of Daytona Beach. We want to thank all of our panelists, Harold Lucas, Bill Schumann, Albert Bethune Jr., Jason Beverlin, and George Bates. Let's give them all a big, big round of applause for being here. And we'd like to thank you for being here, and, and hopefully you've, you've got another little bit of history and knowledge about the great Jackie Robinson. Thank you. Hold on a minute. Wait a minute. Before you go, Mr. Bethune would like to say something real quick. Hey, that I'm going to let you in on a little something. Uh, 2017, there's going to be produced, we're working on it today, a $30 million film on the life of Mary McLeod Bethune by a latter uh, producer. So be prepared, Bethune-Cookman University. They will be here. All right. And the question I want each one of you students to ponder as you leave here is could you do it? Could you have done what Jackie Robinson did? Thank you.